today, you know, to follow with the theme that we're having of SPT phases, um, I want to talk about, ooh, all right, the title's going to be read, guys, symmetry, okay, in topological lattice models. Okay. And um, so, you know, last time, um, you know, we talked about the string net ground space, we talked about the Hamiltonians, okay, and we talked about how to, how to, you know, get from an input fusion category, which we'll call C, to, to its infield center, okay. And so today I would like to talk about Um, two things. So, so kind of the theme of today's lecture is we want to talk about adding symmetry. And I'm going to do this both in the 2D string nets. Okay. But I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, three-dimensional versions of these models. So I'll give a maybe slightly more pedagogical introduction to Walker-Wang models and then tell you a little bit about symmetry there. Okay. And our goal, okay, why would we do this? As Shia emphasized, you know, anytime I can write down a lattice model in which the symmetry acts in an on-site way, I know that there's no funny business, there's no anomalies, this is a legitimate kind of 2D phase of matter, right? And so the questions that, that you might want to answer are, first of all, you know, what SETs, okay, SET means symmetry-enriched topological phase, so we take a topological order and add some symmetry to it. So what SETs are really okay in 2 plus 1D, okay, like anomaly three, free, and, you know, which ones maybe, you know, can only be realized, okay, live at the boundaries of some 3 plus 1 dimensional SPT, okay. So these are kind of the physical questions that would motivate um, going to the trouble of, you know, looking in detail at how we add symmetry to these lattice models. Okay. And so let me begin in 2 plus 1D since that's where we left off. Okay. And so the first thing we need to do is understand how to add symmetry. Okay. And so let me explain what I mean by this. In a small number of cases, you can write down, you know, one of these string net models, and it just so happens that fortuitously it has some symmetry. Okay? So the, you know, the easiest example of this is maybe you care about time reversal symmetry. Okay? So, you know, so sometimes, sometimes there's nothing to add. You know, for example, if I have time reversal symmetry, and that basically requires, so the simplest time reversal symmetry that you can write down is just that the Hamiltonian is equal to its complex conjugate. The Hamiltonian is real, okay? So this does happen in some string net models, you know, in many string net models, actually. So, you know, you can get lucky. But, you know, more generally, if I want to be able to realize all symmetries, which I'm going to focus on unitary symmetries, actually, but, you know, um, I don't know, like maybe I want some kind of spin rotation symmetry or I want some U1 charge symmetry. And those symmetries are not in these string net models. We have to add some things. So, okay. Yeah. Are you talking about on side symmetry or you are talking about on side? So, so I am going to, so, so, you know, right now there's just this observation that, okay, so, t um, yeah. you know, Sometimes there are symmetries. I, I am going to tell you how to realize symmetries in an on-site fashion. So I think what you're thinking of is, you know, if we, an, another famous symmetry of the toric code is a symmetry that interchanges the E and the M anions, okay? Um, and that symmetry can be realized as a lattice symmetry. So there's a, a, an alternative writing of the toric code due to Xiaogang Wen, which is often referred to as the Wen plaquette model, which realizes, you know, E goes to M symmetry as a lattice symmetry. Um, today I'm going to tell you about how to realize symmetries, you know, in a kind of on-site way. Okay. So, but often, 
right? We, we need to explicitly add some extra degrees of freedom, right, that transform under the symmetry, right? Let's call it G. G is our symmetry group. Okay, and we got a couple of them in to, you know, to our string net. Okay, I want to do this in some non-trivial way so we get something interesting happening. Okay, so that's basically the name of the game is, so this is what I'm going to focus on here. Sometimes you get lucky, you already have symmetry, but what if you don't and you want to know, you know, what, what, what symmetries can I add to a given topological order, okay? So basically there's two um, ways that I can add symmetry. I'm going to sketch them both. Okay, so, so how am I going to add these degrees of freedom? Um, and method one is I can add degrees of freedom at the vertices. And I'll give you an example of what this might look like in a minute. Um, and the second thing I could do is I could add degrees of freedom to the plaquettes. Okay, I'm not saying you couldn't do something else. You know, there's, maybe there's interesting constructions where you add these degrees of freedom to the edges, but these are two useful ways for which you know we have built some models that are maybe interesting. Okay, so let me give you an example of method one. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to say too much about the generalities of method one um, unless we have time to talk about it in 3D. But, um, you know, suppose that I want to take my Torah code, okay, and I, in, I don't really care about the Torah code. What I care about is a Z2 spin liquid, okay, in which I have a particle which is topologically like the E particle of the Torah code. So it's, a, it's an anion that's a boson that has, you know, some mutual statistics with another boson that we call M, okay. But it also has this property that it carries spin one half. What should I do? Well, um, one thing I can do is I, I can, so here's my toric code um, uh, space. And so actually, let me, sorry, let me preface this by something. Okay, so when I say toric code, okay, the category, the fusion category that I use to build my string net is just the representations of the group Z2. Okay, so on each edge, right, I have two labels. They can, I'm going to call them zero for the trivial label and one for the non-trivial label. Okay, um, and now um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace this with um, a different Hilbert space in which, so in the string net Hilbert space, in the low energy Hilbert space, I'm going to have two kinds of edges. I'm going to have a zero edge Okay, and I'll put little dots here. And, you know, these are just some spin zero object. Okay, and then at the end of the one edge, I would like to create one edges such that at each end point of the one half, I have the at each end point of the one edge, I have a spin one half. Okay, but I have to be careful. I don't want to just kind of create anything. And so I'm going to make these spin one halves, but I'm going to, I want them in my string net Hilbert space to be paired up. Okay. Paired up in what we call the singlet. Okay. Which is the trivial representation. Okay. You could generalize this from SU2 to other groups, right? I, I need some you know, conjugate representations on the two ends of the end, ends of the edge, and then I want to kind of, you know, put those onto, I want to project in my low energy Hilbert space onto just the, the um, terms where these guys are, you know, paired up into the trivial representation. Okay. And so, and now I can basically modify my Hamiltonian. Oh, sorry. And, and when I do this, so, you know, I have to be a little careful. Okay. So we also have to add a constraint. So these are the states that I'm going to energetically prefer, these two states here. But 
Um, I'm going to add a constraint, which is that I'm always have an even number of spin one halves at each vertex. Okay. Um, so uh, speed zero that's spin. That's all one dimensional, right? Correct. Yes, so, that's a trivial representation. So the, so the Hilbert space nothing changes. Pardon? The, the, Hilbert, the total Hilbert space, the spin at Hilbert space is the same. Is that right? Um, okay. So yes, the, the the low energy the the, the low energy Hilbert space yeah. when these conditions are satisfied, yeah, is the same. So it's the same. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, but but this constraint is important, okay? Um, um, and I I should say this this way of decorating um, is is due to Shia and Ashvin when um, and they used it originally to think about SPT phases, but it's very effective in these topological models too, okay? Um, okay, so so but I, I'm gonna have this constraint. I always want to have an even number of spin a half at each vertex, okay? And that's because you know. Uh, I want to guarantee that each site transforms in a linear representation of SU2. Okay, so um, otherwise you're playing a slightly different game. Okay, and so now, okay, so once I've kind of redefined my string net Hilbert space, it's fairly straightforward to modify the Hamiltonian, okay? Um, so that your string net ground states only have these guys, right? So first of all, I'm going to add a term, right? So, uh, so, sorry, let me, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a term. It's going to be a sum over projectors. Okay. Where P edge projects onto onto these two edges, right? Zero with these two dots, and then one with this singlet on it, okay? And then, you know, I have to modify my vertex term and my plaquette term, okay? Um, and, and, you know, the vertex, and this is straightforward, it's kind of exactly what you would expect. And, you know, the one thing is the plaquette term, right? So now my, BP one, the one string takes, you know, say a plaquette. I'm drawing this on the square lattice here, but don't worry about that. So this is a plaquette, right? And it turns it into a plaquette which has like a little Haldane chain. It's not exactly the Haldane chain because we're not putting in these projectors onto spin one. It looks a lot like a little Haldane chain there. Okay. Great. And so now you can ask, okay, well, you've stuck in these extra degrees of freedom. What do you get for that? And what you get for that that's different is, is, is really due to this. So, you know, if I didn't impose this constraint and I just looked at the energetics, I'd be tempted to say, like, not much has changed. But the constraint is important, okay? And so what's, do, what's new, what's new when I do this is actually when I look at open strings, Okay, so basically, um, I can't satisfy the p edge term on, um, you know, when I make an open string on all of the edges without violating the constraint. Okay, um, and so if I look at the endpoint of an open string, so for example, you know, maybe here's my here's my one edge here, and it's coming in to two zero edges here, right? Um, and so you know, maybe I I, I satisfy this one by putting on this singlet here. But then in order to satisfy the constraint, I have to put an extra spin one half particle, right? Um, and, you know, alternatively, maybe I have three edges coming in here, one, one, one. Okay, so, and, you know, maybe these guys have their singlets already. Okay, but now this guy is, is missing its spin one half, so it's, you know, 
um, um, there's going to be a, uh, let me see if I drew this right. Yeah, so, so this guy, so in this case, you know, and then maybe there's another, this string goes off here, and so this guy has its singlet, oh. Now, I'm not quite sure what's going on with the projector, but okay, now we can see. And so in this case here, I would have an unpaired spin a half, okay? So this way of decorating has endowed my E particle with a spin one half, okay? Um, um, this, is, this is nice. Um, and so let me just say, so, so this is a nice way. You can generalize this, okay? I won't go into the details. But this is a nice way to give your anions fractional charge. Um, okay. Yeah, maybe it's just not. Okay, all right. Hopefully this will, okay. Um, but this is not, you might, you might want to know how to do something more. This is not fully general. And in particular, I, for example, I can't in this way do this symmetry that permutes E and M. Okay, so I can't do anything that permutes the anions. Okay. Okay. So that's method one. Method two. So, so that's you know that's where you might want to um, do something else. Um, so method two would be let's add degrees of freedom to the plaquettes. Okay. Um, so let me draw you a plaquette in my string net. And the degree of freedom that I'm going to add, I have a symmetry group, let's call it G. And so in the middle of my plaquette, I'm going to stick um, some degree of freedom that I'm going to call G, and I'm going to associate it with an element of G. Okay. So, you know, basically this is some, 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 some quantum system that has the same number of states as, as, the, as the rank of the group. We'll think of G as being some discrete group um, for now. Okay. And so... Um, okay, and so now, and I started my string net construction and the topological order, this is, um, oh, oh, okay, so, okay, all right, well, um, we'll, we'll just work with it, um, <laughs> since I don't know how to fix it. Okay, so, so, you know, somewhere down here, so there was this input category C, right? And my topological order that I want is going to be the Drinfeld center of C, okay? But now in order to add this symmetry, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of extend C. I'm going to extend it into a, in a particular way. So I'm going to have what I call a G grading of C, okay? And I'll show you a non-trivial one in a minute, but for now, you know, let me, let's think about a trivial one. And so, so let me call this sort of C1 associated with the identity element, right? And then, you know, this is for different elements of the group, I'm going to have like a copy of C, which formally the labels are different. I'm going to call it C sub G that's associated with some element G of the group. And I have a C H and so on. Okay. So this would be what we call a G graded fusion category. Okay. All right. Um, and so now what we want to do is couple this G in the middle of the plaquette into our string net in such a way that we get some, you know, some interesting G symmetry. Okay. And so the coupling um, again, is going to be, I'm going to write it as like a constraint on the low energy states, right? So I want, you know, states in my H S N prime of a, okay, so let me draw you an edge, okay? The edge has a label S and the plaquette on the left has some group element G and the plaquette on the right has some group element H. 
okay? And so the condition that I want to impose here is that I'm only allowed to choose combinations S, G, and H such that H inverse G, I have to pick some orientation, okay, so you can do that globally on the honeycomb lattice, no problem. H inverse G is equal to G sub S, okay, where, where S is the label. And so, so that means that what this means is that S is in this copy of the category associated with G. Okay. Um, and then, now if I want to have my, so my Hamiltonian has this vertex piece that, you know, you can, you can kind of keep that essentially in the same way once you've imposed this constraint. The other thing I have to do is I have to modify the plaquette term. So remember that my plaquette term, right, I had this BP is sum over S. Okay, and I had this BPS, okay? And so now, and BPS, its role was to like change the labels on the edges of the plaquette, basically. It flipped them in a particular way that was compatible with the vertex constraint. And so now I have to be careful, right? Because when I change this S, right? So this guy takes, you know, this is gonna take some label, whatever, A, right? Going around, let me draw this this way. It takes some label A, you know, whatever, A1, A2, etc. right? And those are gonna get mapped to some new labels A1 prime, A2 prime, etc. And so when they get mapped to the new labels, these new labels could potentially be in a different copy in this grading than the original labels. And if they are, I'm going to also need to change this spin in the middle of the plaquette so that, so that this condition here is still satisfied, okay? And so I can do that, no problem. What I gotta do is take BPS, right? and it's gonna go to BPS, and then basically I'm gonna take, you know, times, times GS. Um, and we have to be a little careful about the orientations here, but um, with a correct definition of the orientation here, uh, this, is, this is this, and so I'm gonna multiply whatever was in here by, you know, by the G um, associated with the level here, and that's gonna keep um, this constraint satisfied. Okay. Um, now this is very general. Okay. In fact, you can um, write down many, many different uh, models for SET phases in this way. And so let me just, and I do want to have time to go to three dimensions. And so let me just take a minute to give you my favorite example. Okay. In terse form. Okay. Um, and this is, this is the EM permuting Torah code where the EM permutation is realized as an on-site symmetry. Okay. So what is the, the um, category? So obviously down here, right, has to be isomorphic to Rev Z2. It just has to have two things, um, two labels. I'm going to call them suggestively one and psi, so this is going to be my C, um, we'll call it the identity, and then this is minus one, okay, so I'm going to do a multiplicative representation of the Z2 symmetry, and okay, and so here, uh, you know, obviously one times one is one, one is the identity, psi times psi is equal to one, okay, and then up here, I have a single label, I'm going to call sigma, and this guy is going to obey that sigma times sigma equals one plus psi. Okay. So the rule here, by the way, I think I sort of forgot to say, but you know, if I take two labels in this non-trivial Z2 um, component, the, the, the rule is that they have to fuse to labels down here. So the fusion rules have to like respect the group multiplication basically. So that's a, that's a property that these have to have. Okay. Good. And so the allowed edges now with the constraints. So, so now my plaquettes have, have 
two um, labels, one and minus one, and I'm going to represent them as kind of black and white. Okay, so suppose that I have a black plaquette with a white plaquette. Okay, so that edge has to be sigma. Okay, um, and similarly, okay, this has to be sigma. And if I had two black plaquettes or two white plaquettes, the edge between them can be either one or psi. Okay. And then um, my modified plaquette term is a half, okay, one plus BP associated with the psi string plus BP associated with the sigma times, you know, I'll call this, this is the non-trivial group element, okay, of Z2. So this is going to flip, flip the plaquette. Okay. Um, okay, and so now, okay, so now you might wonder, well, okay, we have these extra edges, and so, you know, many of you might recognize this set of labels, one sigma and psi, we use these to, like, label the Ising CFT, and so you might worry that this model has, like, you know, no longer the Torah code topological order. But that is in fact not true. And the reason that it's not true is because, you know, is because of these constraints, okay? So if I go to any 2D lattice and I'm gonna try and color it in two colors, right? So I'm gonna have some black regions and some white regions, right? But basically, and now remember that my sigmas, I like to draw them in red, okay, so the sigmas can only live on the boundaries between black regions and white regions, okay? And this is actually, um, um, you don't necessarily have to impose it as a constraint, but if you, if you try to draw an open sigma line, okay, you know, what, what happens? Well, you know, I have some kind of like, you know, imagine I have a black region over here, okay, and, and here's its boundary, and I try and draw like an open sigma line that only runs along part of the boundary, okay? Now, I have like a whole bunch of edges here which are excited, okay? So, so this is like a very high energy defect, okay? And so, so really, like, there is no point-like object associated with open sigma lines, okay? And so the topological order is that of the toric code, right? So we get no open sigma strings. Okay, so the topological order is that of the toric code, okay? But you can also convince yourself that you do have open strings corresponding to E and M, okay, and also E times M, okay. And basically, that, that when you flip all of the spins on the plaquettes, that these are interchanged, okay. Interchanged by swapping white and black regions. Okay, so the global Z2 symmetry is, is all it does is it goes to these plaquettes and it just turns all the black plaquettes white and all of the white plaquettes black. Yeah? So in your model here, what is the total of your first stage? We have a Z2 on the plaque and we also have a Z2 on the ring. Correct. So how do you represent a sigma here? Um, right, right, so good, good, good. So, so I, so I, I extended my set of edge labels. So the set of edge labels that I have is no longer just, you know, this Z2 set, right? But I also have sigma in my set of edge labels. But then I impose this condition. So I couple the degrees of freedom at the Z2 degrees of freedom in the plaquette centers to these edge labels. Um, and I can do that energetically or I can impose it as a constraint. But, you know, in either case, in this sort of low energy string at Hilbert space, Sigma has to live at the, at the kind of domain wall, if you will, between white and black regions, 
And so, yeah. So that sort of sigma can live here, right, or here, but it can't live here or here. And so in that way, it's not that, so, so we have these sigma strings, they're in the, they're in the Hilbert space, but we are um, you know, explicitly killing any configurations with open sigma strings in terms of the low energy quasi-particles. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, great. And you know, like within each region, you could write down your E and M strings, okay? And then um, you, know, you can kind of see for yourself that uh, a, a string that looks like, you know, sort of like psi with trivial braiding, I'll call that psi sort of zero here. If it crosses into here, this becomes the one that has no, um, that's only the half braiding, right? Whatever we call that, we'll call that like, like B, okay? And so, and, and this is all one string type, so this is the string type, you know, so this might be your E, right? So E, you know, psi string in white and, you know, this, you know, braiding only string in the black region. And then M would be the opposite. M would be, um, you know, so M, you know, the B string in the white region and the psi in the black region. Okay. Okay. And so those are interchanged by the symmetry. Um, great. Okay, and so, so this construction is very general. We can realize many, many symmetries um, of, you know, of anion theories with Drinfeld centers in this way, okay? Um, and, you know, as long as you, it, it, if you pick your favorite symmetry group, right, as long as you kind of are confident you know what all the G-graded categories are um, for, you know, with, associated with this fusion category, you can, you can build all of them, okay? Um, and so that kind of wraps up what I wanted to say about 2D, right? But you might ask, so there's two things that, you know, we can't touch with this construction. First of all, we can't touch chiral theories. And, and second of all, we can't say anything about, you know, like there's things that we know that we can't realize with lattice models in 2D. And, and, and you know, we also can't say anything about those theories, so the anomalous theories. And so to, to access those, um, what we're going to do, okay, is we're going to go to 3 plus 1D, okay? And so our goal is to talk about symmetry in 3 plus 1D, but let me start by telling you about, because I haven't told you yet, how we build, you know, lattice models um, that have something to do with interesting topological orders in 3 plus 1D. Okay. And these are often called Walker-Wang models um, because they were introduced by Kevin Walker and Zheng Han Wang. Okay, so um, the idea here, and I'm gonna go much more quickly than I did in two plus one D, okay? Because conceptually the idea is very similar, so I'm gonna kind of just highlight the differences, okay? So, you know, as before, we're gonna have some trivalent lattice, okay, and so um, the trivalent lattice that they drew in 3D is not so straightforward to draw, but um, it looks something like this, so this is an edge going up, here's an edge going down, here's an edge coming out, okay, um, and, okay, and so on, okay, so you can continue this on. Um, okay, so you basically take your cubic lattice and you point split the vertices and you can get something trivalent. And then you have to practice drawing it um, over and over to get it right. Okay, but we have a trivalent lattice in 3D, okay? And we can define a Hilbert space, you know, the Hilbert space of the Walker-Wang models. Um, and okay, so again, you know, You know, so there's some identity string. We have some set of labels on each edge, okay? And we could define a Walker-Wang-Hilbert space, right, as the set of graphs obeying 
some branching rules. Right, and so again, let me um, assume for today that we are we don't have fusion multiplicities, and so these branching rules just come from, you know, some fusion structure on these labels, and I can, you know, um, so they just tell me that you know when I have like, um, you know, A B C that basically N A B C is not equal to zero. Okay, um, and then within this. So, so this so far looks exactly like 2D, okay? And now, as I did in 2D, within this, you know, kind of Walker-Wang-Hilbert space, I would like to define some local rules, okay, uh, such that I can kind of deform configurations in an interesting way. Um, and If you look in any particular plane of the lattice, okay, if you look at planar graphs, those local rules are exactly um, like what we did in 2D, although um, um, in this case, I, I think you probably need more symmetry of the F symbols in order to, to make that work. Um, but we also need, So when you start sort of drawing arbitrary graphs in three dimensions, you are going to run into situations where you have crossings. And so we also need some kind of local rules that tell us what to do when we have this. Um, right? And similarly, when we have this. Okay. And so that, that means that in order to kind of specify data that gives you a complete set of local rules, you need to introduce, you know, some way to resolve these over and under crossings. Okay, so we need to have, I think this one is usually called R inverse. Um, right. And this one is usually called R. Okay. And this means, so this is, um, this is a, an important distinction, okay, that we can't just start from an arbitrary fusion category, okay? We need, you know, because you're gonna encounter graphs with both of these crossings, okay? So we really need um, a braided fusion category. Okay, unitary pivotal fusion category. Okay, so that's, you know, in terms of the data, that's the main difference, kind of a big difference. Okay, and now um, the Hamiltonian. Um, so again, let me just focus on the differences. Okay, so, you know, this, I have, sorry, let me, let me remind you that the Hamiltonian, it's a commuting projector Hamiltonian, which has the general form, you know, sum over V, a V minus sum over P, B P, okay? Where once again, the vertex terms are exactly as they were. They just energetically favor stuff that is um, picked out by the fusion rules, okay? And the plaquette terms also, you know, they have a very similar form. It's like a sum over string types. Okay, I've got some coefficient, which is gonna be proportional. We'll just take it to be proportional to the quantum dimension. Okay. Um, and then I've got this string operator. And, and so let me remind you in 2D, right, what did BPS mean? Well, we said, so let me draw, here's a, here's a plaquette. I'll draw it in the plane. Okay, and um, Okay, uh, so here's the other. Okay, um, and so, you know, in the plane, what I do, and maybe, maybe this will be um, blue, is I just sort of take a loop, right? And I just act by fusion, okay? But there is something a little different here because, um, 
you know, I mean, the plaquette sits in a plane, but I also have these edges. I have edges that go up like this. Okay, and I have one, you know, kind of going down like this and so on. So I have these edges in my lattice that do not sit in the plane. Okay. And so the, the, the philosophy is exactly the same. You stick in this loop, you act by fusion, but we have to figure out what to do about those crossings. Okay. And so what to do about the crossings is that before you act with your placat loop, okay, you're going to use your R symbols, your kind of local rules, if you will, to pull this over like this, okay, so that somehow you now think of this as being kind of far away from this junction, okay, and now you can fuse. So this is okay. We have no weird crossing with the plaquette string, and then we fuse, you know, exactly as we usually did. Okay, and we resolve this. Okay, and then at the last step, right? So whoops, Daisy. Eventually, okay. So we do all our fusion, and then eventually we kind of twist this back, right? Okay, so we resolve these and twist this back. And so you know the Hamiltonian. Uh, or actually, let me more precisely, BPS, um, you know, it's got a bunch of Fs and these, you know, Y coefficients, but it also involves R matrices, okay? And let me not, you know, the exact formula is in their paper. Um, it's not very enlightening. I think the intuitive way to think about it is really just you, you act with this fusion with the loop. Um, okay, so here's our Hamiltonian. It looks almost exactly the same. Really, the only difference is we have these R symbols in our Hamiltonian. So you might think, huh. Yes? Uh, can you explain why you have to push the vertical line out of the way and then pull it back later? Uh, why could you just not get there for the future? Um, so, uh, yeah, good question. The, um, So off the top of my head, I'm not sure whether you have to think about it that way or whether you could, I mean, okay, so, so one thing is like, you know, if you think of the local rules as de defined in terms of these edge variables, then, you know, this is something that you know how to, you know, I mean, this, it's kind of a circular argument, but, you know, by the local rules, you should be able to do this and it should be R, you know, when in the ground state. And of course, you have to check that the Hamiltonian gives you back the right state. Um, but, but, you know, at least for for simple models, I think you could equally well, you know, so you could fuse first, right? But but I think, you know, at the, at the end of the day, in, in order to resolve this, I, I, I kind of, in order to resolve this, I kind of need to use an R. Like. But isn't there some phase when you pull that one to the red and then the inverse phase? And put it ah, ah. I mean, yes and no, right? So here's the point. So before I fused, yeah, so let me put, let me, let me zoom in and we can put some labels in here. Okay, so before I fused, this is like I out here, okay? And maybe this is I prime, okay? And this is like J and this is J prime. And this guy, maybe this guy is K, okay? And so now, so there's an intermediate, you know, step here where I have, so now I resolve this bubble, okay, and I still have K going out here, but when I collapse this blue guy here, then I just have like an I prime, J prime, K vertex. And so, yeah, so when I go from here to here, right, so if I put this in I, J, K, so this has, I'm going to mess up R and R inverse, but this, you know, this is like R, like whatever, K, I, J. Forgive me if I have done it, <laughs> written it backwards. But then, you know, this one is, um, so, but then this one would be like an R, you know, K, I prime, J prime inverse. And so they don't cancel each other, if that's your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not, it's not trivial. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and so uh, so we have this just 
seemingly rather slight modification of the plaquette operator. What does that do to the physics? So to understand that, we're going to, again, try to build quasi-particle string operators, OK? So you know, what did we, what's the physics? What, what physical difference does this make? So we look at quasi-particle string operators, right? And so we want, so we want a string, I was calling it s hat i f, such that it commutes maybe that it commutes with all the terms in the in the Hamiltonian away from the initial point i and the final point f. Okay. Now the vertex term, okay, this is fine. This is no problem. But Let's look at the plaquette term. So let me, again, I'm, I'm going to, I'm not going to kind of write out matrix elements. I'm going to draw you some pictures. So, so, so S is a string operator. Okay. And here, here's a little piece of my lattice. Okay. Going like this. And here's my, oh, let's see. I think I want a vertical edge going up here. Okay. And here's my string operator and it's going to come down and around and it's going to go this way. Okay, and so this is some state, right? So this is like, I took some state, you know, the state, whatever this, this state here was, right? Um, and I acted with S hat on it, okay? And so now, okay, so now if I wanna um, now act with the plaquette operator, right? So now let me act with BP, okay? So what I have to do is take this picture. Okay, we have S hat acting first. Okay, and then maybe my plaquette string is going to be red. And now I draw my plaquette string, and it's going like this. Okay, and and this, you know, I mean, this looks like super sketchy. Am I tethered to? So I just. Oh wow. I think I just unplugged the microphone. Okay, here we go. Um, right, so, so, so this looks like super sketchy, but this is actually, if you took this picture and you resolved everything using like a fusion of the rating, this, this would literally give you the right matrix elements for, um, for, let me write it up here, right, for this here, BP, okay? So it looks like a total cartoon, but it's, it's really, tele, you know, it, it is really an exact representation. Now, on the other hand, what if I wanted to take my state, whatever it is, okay, a little kind of schematic here, and I wanted to first act with BP, and then I wanted to act with S hat. So that would give me a picture that looks like this. So here's my lattice, okay. And now, since BP acted first, I first draw my plaquette loop, okay, and I act with you know, I fuse it in, I do, do everything I need to resolve that. And then, after I fuse that in, then I fuse the string operator in, okay? And so now our criteria, okay, so now in terms of these pictures, you can see our criterion for a string operator to commute with BP has to be that evaluating this diagram is the same as evaluating the diagram on the top. In other words, Okay, so the criterion BP S hat equals S hat BP tells us that this diagram here with the BP outside of the S had better give me the same thing as this diagram here with the BP encircling the S. Okay, in other words, so, and sorry, I should put a little BP, this should be BP with an S, right? And this is labeled S, okay? And this guy, this string operator has some, some label here, okay? But so basically this requires, you know, S. So suppose I, I label this guy with alpha, right? So S, S alpha over S, um, zero alpha S, zero S to be one. In other words, 
you know, because I, I'm working with a braided fusion category, and so this string, this string had better braid trivially with everybody, right? Because there's a, there's, there's a loop with S for every S. So if I want to make something that, that commutes with all the plaquette prep um, op terms, it has to braid trivially with everybody in the category, okay? And so the conclusion is that this little tweak of, you know, adding these R's, the Hamiltonian, and putting things in 3D, looked kind of benign. But what it means is that actually, if my underlying category is modular, it's a unitary modular tensor category, then there are no point particles in the bulk. Now, I should say that I have not even tried to argue that, you know, this construction using string operators is complete, okay? Um, and I don't, you know, really know how to argue that in terms of the string operators, but I think, you know, based on what we know about partition functions and connections to, like, invariance of four manifolds, uh, you know, you would certainly believe that this is complete, okay? But, but I'm not going to, like, I certainly haven't shown you that, okay? But let's, let's sort of take that as a given, and we can certainly check it explicitly in many simple examples, okay? No point particles, okay? No topological order, okay? So this bulk looks very boring, okay? And as Zhang Wen said yesterday, like very boring, like almost trivial, okay? Almost trivial. It's like a highly non-trivial, trivial phase, okay? Um, now, if C, so, you know, it, it can also be the case that C is braided but not modular, okay? So it's like a pre, pre-modular is the word that Zheng Han and Kevin used in their pap paper. Okay, so then basically you have some particles that are transparent. They braid trivially with everybody, okay? And so the point particles... Um, there's a point particle for every transparent, you know, object in the category. Now, note, an important note is you cannot be transparent unless you braid trivially with yourself, okay? In order to braid trivially with yourself, you must be either a boson, sorry, I cannot talk and write at the same time, apparently. Um, you must be either a boson, or a fermion. Okay. And that is uh, very satisfying as a physicist because there are you know, fundamental reasons based on representations of the braid group and so on that, that as point particles, we do not believe that we can realize anything other than bosons and fermions in three plus one dimensions. Good. Um, Okay, and so now let me, I'm just going to say in words, so there are, um, of course, non-point-like excitations in the bulk, okay? Uh, if the category is modular, you basically can get kind of like string defects, okay? You try and make one of these string operators, it violates a whole bunch of plaquettes, it makes this kind of tube defect. In the, in the non-modular case, you can also get objects that are intrinsically vortex loops, okay? So that you get the bulk topological order being some kind of digraph witten theory, okay? And the other thing that I want to mention is that, okay, so here's the big but. If I look at the surface of this system, okay, so here's my, you know, I have some kind of surface here, and all of the edges going down into the bulk are going downward, okay? Now there's no plaquettes sticking out of the surface, okay? So here, this kind of braiding with BP obstruction is not there, and I can take a string, right? I can start at I, and I can run it over, but not under, only over. I can run it over the lattice from some point I to F, okay? And so I do get deconfined point particles. on the surface. Um, okay. And so if I have a, a category, you know, if I take a UMTC, right, basically what I get, let's call it C. Okay, so here's, imagine that I have periodic boundary conditions around these edges that I'm scribbling on. OK. 
Okay. I put it on like a thickened torus. Okay. What this gives me is a copy of C on the top, a copy of, let me just erase this. Okay. I get a copy of C with the opposite chirality on the bottom and nothing in between. Okay. So this is the sense. And now, of course, you know, I could also like, hey, why not? Let's take a, let's take a torus. Good grief. Um, let's take a torus. Okay, I can fill in the middle, right? And now I can just have a single chirality C living on the boundary of my torus, okay? So in this way, I can write a commuting projector model, which realizes, you know, any kind of like, any UMTC that I want, right? But I pay the price that, you know, the Hamiltonian does have to be extended in this dirty bulk, even though the bulk is topologically trivial. Um, so at this point, I should ask uh, how much time I have. I was going to give a couple of examples um, and say a couple of things about symmetry, but I also don't want to cut into the break. So uh, we're supposed to read the mean at four. Right. Uh, but maybe, maybe five or ten minutes. Okay. I, 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 can, I, think, I think in five minutes I can give you guys the essence of what I wanted to say. Okay. So examples. So I, I'm going to talk about two examples that I think are interesting. Um, let me start with the one that, that um, so actually let, let, let me start with, with my favorite example. Um, which physicists often call U1 level 3, okay? And really as a UMTC, this is often called Z3 times Z2 with some indices, okay? Um, okay, so I'll call it like a charge. This is like, it's um, just some label. Um, RAA 2A, okay? And it's Z3 cross Z2 label. Okay, so I have a particle that, so now the charge here refers to like, I haven't put electric charge in this theory, but if you wanted to associate this with the topological order of a Laughlin state, this would be like an E over three quasi particle. It, it's braiding with itself is E to the I pi over three. And in this language here, it corresponds to one, one. Um, okay. Um, e to the 4 pi i over 3, and this is 2, 0. Okay, charge 1. Okay. And And then there's, you know, two is zero, zero. Okay. Um, so look, I'm not gonna like write out the Hamiltonian or anything, but um, this, is, this is an example of a category that's, that's interesting that um, has a transparent particle, okay? So this guy is a fermion. Um, which braids trivially with everyone. This is well known, you know, people talk about like quantum Hall phases. And so if you literally use this category, right, what you get is a bulk has a sort of Z2 3D topological order with, you know, fermion, you know, sort of charge. So the point particles are fermions, okay? And on the surface, in addition to this fermion being able to come to the surface, we also have these like Z3 anions, just like the Laughlin state. Okay. And if you want to think about this as a fermionic phase of matter, um, you can sort of make a tweak to the bulk. Um, and and D Dave Austin worked, worked this out with Kevin Walker. Um, you know, so that you sort of effectively uh, can think of these bulk fermions as not emergent and leading to topological order, but just local. 
um, fundamental excitations. Okay. Um, so that's like a nice example of how this sort of pre-modular category might emerge in a way that's interesting. And so the last example that I want to give, um, which is, and I'll say a couple things about symmetry. So the three fermion toric code. Okay. So I'm not going to write down the Hamiltonian. Um, Jungwon wrote it down yesterday, but you know, basically, so the S matrix is modular, right? Oh my gosh, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. Okay, and an amusing fact about this is, you know, you can ask, well, you know, R A B A plus B, okay, E M. Epsilon, E, M, Epsilon. So these guys are all fermions. And then um, they're, right, and so I'm going to get this. Um, and so the, so if I take E with Epsilon, it's 1. If I take Epsilon with E, it's minus 1, okay. Um, and let's see if I take M with epsilon, I'm going to get minus one and then epsilon with M is going to be one. And then E with M is going to be minus one and this is going to be plus one. Okay. Now, why am I writing this out for you? This is, you know, to some degree it's a gauge choice, but there is a choice in which all of the entries of this R are real. Okay. So first of all, this is modular. Okay, so the bulk is trivial, no 3D topological order, okay. On the surface, I have, you know, this E, M, and Epsilon, and because these R's are real, right, so this is statement one, it's modular. Statement two is the Hamiltonian is real, okay. So this is one of these cases where the Hamiltonian, you know, in this gauge just happens to have time reversal symmetry, okay? And you can ask, what is surprising about this, okay? What's surprising about this is that this topological order, so another fact about it, is that it has central charge four, okay? So it has a chiral gapless boundary. Okay. So what's interesting about that is that obviously a chiral boundary is incompatible with time reversal. So in two dimensions, this topological order is incompatible with time reversal, it cannot be time reversal invariant, and yet you can realize it at the boundary of a 3D system. Okay. So this is an example. Okay. Bulk is trivial surface has topological order that realizes symmetry in a way that you cannot, you know, that's not possible in 2D. So this is a, an example of a 3 plus 1D SPT. Um, and I can just, you know, sort of comment that there are other ways to generate 3 plus 1D SPTs by doing what I described at the beginning, which is, um, so, you know, we, um, I, I, uh, you can add degrees of freedom, you can add them to the vertices, okay, and make anions transform in projective representations. And in that way, you can realize, um, you know, both non-anomalous and anomalous phases at the boundaries of these 3D systems. You can also actually add degrees of freedom to plaquettes, and there's a paper by um, Don Williamson and, and Jung Han where they, where they worked that out as well, okay? And so the, the you know, the moral, so we can also add symmetry, right? We can also add symmetry, you know, some symmetry group G, just as we did in 2 plus 1D, okay? And here, okay, so we can realize all UMTCs, okay? And we can also realize as, you know, as the boundary theory of some at the boundary of some three manifold. And we can all also realize all 
SETs with either, you know, no obstruction, no anomaly, or um, a certain class of anomalies, which is known as the H4 anomalies. Okay, so a certain kind of um, obstruction to realizing symmetries in two dimensions, those can also be realized at the boundaries of these systems. Let me stop there. Sorry for going a little over time.